see you, you see um, a lot of places opening up. Mask mandates being taken out here in California, where we have like the most draconian. Disneyland is opening up the limited capacity on April first. They're going to have indoor and outdoor sporting events opening up this year. So it's like, all right, if that's the case. At 10% capacity, hello. Well, AMC in New York City is open up right now at 25% or 50% capacity. I think it's 25%. But they're moving that way. So I was thinking about this, and I'm thinking, okay, what would be a good topic for today? And I'm like, well, <laughs> let's keep it kind of topical and like, you know, as far as like not topical, but just like relevant as far as the timing. And let's talk about how to approach running your business or starting a business in a post COVID world now that we're starting to reopen. And so there's a couple areas we want to hit. The first one we want to talk about, and I want to kind of get your take on this. I'll kind of run point on this, but I want you to, mm. I want to really hear what you have to say on this because I think you have some really good input. Mm. Is number one, for, let's say you have somebody has an existing online business, but Demand went down for whatever reason. You couldn't, you really couldn't go out and network. Um, you have a bunch of people that, honestly, were living on government checks. Didn't have a whole lot of money to spend. Maybe it's a, like a situation for you where you do coaching, but it's tough to get clients for your clients, right? Um, talk about how you're planning or how somebody should plan, depending on how you want to approach it. Um, if you were talking to one of your clients, how they should approach you know, things now that they're starting to reopen, now that people are going to spend more money, maybe they're starting to work again, maybe there's more demand in the economy. So what? tell me a little bit about kind of, if we had a window right. into some of the coaching sessions that you have or some of the counseling sessions you have. <clears throat> well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, whether it's an online business or a brick and mortar business, in today's world, with today's technology, it needs to be both. It needs to be both. If you had, a, I don't care if you, if you have a pizza, you, you can't get more brick and mortar than a pizza delivery, pizza restaurant, okay? It still has to have an online component, both from the point of view of promotion and from the point of view of transactions and the point of view of, of logistics, okay? You're going to use the technology either way. Now, the only difference between what my clients did before and what they can do now and what they can do in the future only boils down to one thing, fear. If the majority of people out there are in a fear mode, then they don't want to spend money. If they don't want to spend money, then the things that they were going to spend money on get put on the back burner. That's otherwise known as pent up demand. So what I do to, 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 to advise my clients, I'm in the business of helping them get more business. I'm in the business of helping them to grow their business, expand their business, market their, their pro services and products, and, and do that in a more effective way with a better ROI, return on their investment. So, uh, so that's not going to change. That is not going to change for any business, okay? Now, granted, if you're an event manager, you run an airline, uh, you, you run a cruise ship company, you, uh, you, you, you run a theater, anything where people have to physically get together, you're praying and hoping and wishing and guessing that things are going to get better because we're in an ocean of vaccination stuff happening and that, you know, barring the Andromeda strain or, or zombies eating brains, um, things are going to open up again. But there, it's going to take time. So hopefully you're going to operate out of what is commonly referred to as 2020 hindsight. You're going to re you're going to realize that hopefully you've learned something. You're going to use the technology. You're 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 going to use it for marketing, you're going to use it for logistics, you're going to use it for transaction and you're going to continue to you know, satisfy the needs of your clients or, or, or customers and get more clients and customers. But here's the thing. 
it is going to be competitive as all get out, okay? It's kind of like, if you have a pizza restaurant, it's kind of like there's five more pizza restaurants on your block now, okay? And you have to understand the dynamics of that. So it's going to be extremely difficult for the small business with 20 or less employees. It's going to be extremely challenging if you're only operating within a 10 mile radius, you know, the only people that come to see you or buy your stuff is within a 10 mile radius of your brick and mortar store, okay? It's going to be extremely difficult if you don't know how to do marketing effectively using digital and using the technology and using uh, the uh, uh, digital space, okay? So, you're, gone, you're, you're on a steep learning curve if you want to survive, is what I'm saying. And that's why my clients pay me what they pay me, is because I help them get up that learning curve so that they will survive and do better. Um, but it, it's, it's, going to, it's tough slogging, okay? It's going to be a tough road to hoe for any business. But the people, the businesses that have the best uh, advantage right now are your big corporations. And they're the ones that are driving the stock market, and they're the ones that are, are in the best position to survive, your Johnson & Johnsons, your Procter & Gamble's, your Exxon's, and et cetera, et cetera. They're the ones, but your mom and pop could be going the way of the dinosaur, seriously. You might have the best pizza on the block, but you're competing against Domino's and you're competing against pizza. I don't know if Pizza Hut's still in business or not, whatever. You could have the best pizza in the world. But if you're not taking advantage of hopefully what you've learned during the last year and a half, you're probably not going to survive. And that's the bottom line. There's many businesses out there that are 20 employees and less that are marginal. They were barely making it before. Okay, now how are they going to survive? They can't just get PPP loans forever. Okay, they can't get government money forever. Um, it's it's a tough it's a tough tough question and a and, and a tough situation. I, I I don't want to be negative about it, but I've got to be realistic. So you brought something up I thought that was interesting. You, you brought up the fact that the competition is going to be pretty fierce. You want to talk about why that is? I mean, it's always good. You're always going to have competition, but why do you think it's going to be particularly notable this time around? Because um, of a variety of factors, okay? Will there be pent-up demand? Yes, but there's still fear, and people are still not going to be spending money like there's no tomorrow, okay? They're not going to be spending money like, uh, you know, dollar bills are going to be worthless tomorrow. They, they're, 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 keeping, they're keeping everything on the, on the down low, you know? Uh, most people are. Most people are not saying, okay, yeah, um, I'm talking about the majority, the, the middle class or, or even – people that are out there making minimum wage that haven't paid their rent for four months, that haven't paid their credit cards for four or five months, um, that are barely, you know, barely able to afford, to afford gas to get to work if they have a job, okay? Um, th these people aren't gonna go out and say, whoa, we, you know, the party, you know, the, the, the bad stuff is over, the good stuff is happening and let's just go spend money. It's not gonna happen. It could take years, years, okay, for, for this pent-up demand to be released. And just because you give everybody $1,400 does not mean the whole one, economy, one. huh? Whatever. Just one, two, yeah. Yeah, just because you gave everybody $1,400 one time or even twice or even three times does not mean that the whole economy now is going to be a big party. You know, it's just not, it's not going to happen. I personally believe that the reason 
that they're giving away 1.9 trillion, okay, or whatever it is, and they're giving the 1,400 away to every person that's making less, less than 80,000, is so it's a smokescreen for giving money, other money to people that politicians love to give money to, which are the people that got them elected. Not, 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 not the American citizen, but I'm talking about the lobbyists and the, and the, and the people that, that run the big corporations. Are, they're the ones that line up for the big bucks. Okay, that's why we call it a big pork barrel, right? So uh, it's complicated. I don't think it's an, it is going to be, I don't think the vaccine is the easy solution to everything. It may be the solution to getting kids back in school. I, think it's, be, tool, you know. I think it's a tool, but I think the one thing that I've seen over the last, and I said this back in April, so I, I'm, not, I'm just not saying this now. I think, well, I said for the longest time, I probably said on this podcast once or twice, I said the longer the lockdowns go, the, the more scarring there's going to be in the, the public sentiment. And, you know, people said, okay, well, let's say you get everybody vaccinated. I think you're still going to see people wearing masks. Some people will. Like, you're not going to see that go away. Not in Texas, but they will. Yeah. Well, but they're not making them in Texas. That's the key. But you'll still see people wearing masks in Texas, for sure. Mm. Um, it's only when you get to a point where it becomes socially unacceptable where people are kind of... And people are, have a herd mentality. So, you know, if you, if you walk into a place and everybody's wearing a mask, you're going to put a mask on. But if you walk in and you're the only person wearing a mask, you're probably going to take it off. Like most people will. That's just how it works. But I think it's going to take, I think it's going to, there's going to be some scarring that has to be overcome. I think, you know, people are going to go to movies and, you know, can imagine going to a full house watching Top Gun and there's people shoulder to shoulder. Like that's not going to happen to begin with. So I don't think they're going to release that movie right away. Um, sporting events, the same thing. Can you imagine going to an NBA game or a hockey game and it's like 21,000 people in an enclosed central air conditioning place? Like, it's going to take a while for that to happen. It will go back to normal for sure. Um, and it's interesting. One of the things I was thinking about the other day was, uh, I think it was, I think it was, was it Calvin Coolidge that said return to normalcy? It's a word that doesn't exist. Or was it, or was it Wilson that said that? I want to say it was Coolidge. Yeah, it was Coolidge. I think it was and, Coolidge. Uh, I think we yeah. both agree it's Coolidge. And it was like, the question that I was wondering is, was he, was, was he saying a return to normalcy from a post-World I world, or was it a post-Spanish flu world? And I was thinking, mm. I don't know. I would have to ask somebody who's been around there, but I, or maybe I'll have to look it up. But it's like, my initial thought is it makes more sense. I always thought it was a post-World War I world. It makes more sense to return to normalcy when you go back at, looking at it as a post-Spanish flu world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think back then that was something even the president said, is, okay, we're going to go back to normal. And then they had a hidden, they had 1919, was what they call the hidden uh, depression, and then 20, everything took off. Um, so yeah, I think it's gonna it's gonna take some time. It's gonna depend on the state you're in. It's gonna depend on the weather. You know, here where I live in Karen Heights, it's, you know, they're probably gonna be wearing masks until like 2200. Um, and if not, they'll call the police on you. That's probably a good thing. A lot of those people should be wearing masks, even if there wasn't a pandemic. Oh, I'm telling even you, if there forget, wasn't. Forget the mask that just covers your nose. They should just wear a full ski mask. Like I don't want to see them. Okay, that would be great. That, that's a great point. I appreciate that. Motorcycle um, helmet. Um, I think a full stormtrooper outfit would be great. Perfect. I don't know why everybody wasn't issued one of those you know, a year and a half ago. Right. Space suit. You can get one of Elon Musk's space suits. Yeah. Yeah, they look cool. And if it's winter yeah. time, then you know it works best because you could you have the heating element. Um, okay, so it costs a million dollars a space yeah, suit. Per, oh well but you know what's what print more what's your, money what's, what's your life worth if not worth a million dollars <laughs> but anyways getting back to what you're saying i think that i think you're going to see people who i think everything's gradual so you have all these people that are going to you know want to get back working but when business is closed and, and you drive well you don't get out of your house but i i just i was driving around hillcrest i was driving around other areas of the city and i was really surprised 
Old Town, for example, and people who don't live in San Diego, that's like our tourist Mexican food area. We were, we were out to dinner, and I went past all these places that used to be open restaurants. They're all shut down. Shut down. Closed, gone, out of business. It was shocking how many of them were, uh, were in that condition. And it's like people are like, okay, I want to open back up, but you have the, the, the food, beverage, and entertainment. They're, they're only going to go up with demand, so the jobs aren't there. And then you have companies that you may have had a job, and let's say you were a staff accountant, right? And you worked in an office, but that company just spent the last year adapting itself to work in a place where everybody worked from home and being able to survive with half of its office staff. They've kind of trained themselves to get by without you. So I don't think those jobs are there. I think I agree with what you're saying. I think there's going to be a lot of people that, start, that want to start their own gig, be it a pizza place or whatever it is. I think for you, especially, you know, a coach, you know, helping people, you know, get to where they want to get and make an impact. I think that's going to go through the roof. One, because I think it's, there's a part of like the Maslow's hierarchy where they feel like they have to have an impact on the world. But I think part of it is it's a lack of other options. You know, it's not like companies are going to be banging down their door in the next six months to be hiring people. I just don't think that's the case. And it's like, all right, well, am I going to go through this again? And, 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 and in the scheme of we have a dot-com crash, we have a housing crash, we have, um, and then we have this happen. It's like, how many times do you have to be kicked in the face where you realize that maybe being a kickboxer is not your best you know, outcome. And I think there's going to be people that said, screw it. You know, I played this game and I've lost. You know, it's like day trading. It's like I tried to buy GameStop at 150 and it went down and I sold it at 80. And it's like, this is not for me. And I, I'm just not doing this. I'm not playing this game anymore. It's not, forget financially. Financially, it sucks. But just from a, a mental energy standpoint, like I'm just not, I'm not jumping, I'm not the hamster jumping up on that, that wheel anymore. And I think there's going to be people doing that for sure. And I think the people who are going to be successful, and I want to get your take on this point, are the people that give the most thought to that and are able to predict kind of how that plays out the best. So like if I'm starting a business right now, let's say I wanted to be a coach, I would, I would highly think that I would, I would want to target people who got hammered in the last year and want to do something just polar opposite different. So maybe they were working as a restaurant assistant manager and they realized this just sucks. I'm, you know, I got to do something different. Maybe they want to, I don't know what they want to do. Maybe, you know, they're going to go to a totally different thing. Maybe they want to be a life coach. Mm. You know, Don't recommend it. I, I, well, it's good for them if they're listening to this to say, well, Al doesn't recommend it, but I don't recommend do being a life coach. I don't recommend it. Uh, most of the people that are life coaches already have some other income stream, uh, their husband, their trust fund, uh, their corporate job, uh, their life savings. Uh, they made a killing in the stock market. I don't, I don't know what it is, but they, they, they no, no. Um, life coach isn't the thing to go what into. It, now, what do you, keep in mind that what, I work, I work with my clients are typically reasonably successful already, okay, and they want to be more successful. They're not starting from ground zero or square one, okay, and I am a marketing strategist. The business coaching is only a piece of what I do, okay, so as a marketing strategist and PR promotion person, I help them to get more business, but I help them to do it in a way that makes sense, okay, so, so what I, so that's, that's my area of expertise. I'm not in the business of taking somebody who used to be a waiter and telling them they're going to write the next best greatest movie script and become a Hollywood mogul. I'm not in the business of telling people, well, you used to, uh, you know, work in a car wash, but you really, your passion is life coaching. So um, what you really want to do is become a successful life coach. Now, I, I don't do that. I, most of the people that do that, most of the people that make money in life coaching are people that sell services to life coaches. Life coaches don't make any money, okay? And even if they did make money, they only have so much time. There's only so much time in a day. 
How many people are you going to spend one-on-one -on -one time, hour by hour with each day to help them with their life? You'll be burned out in a month, okay? It just doesn't work that way. I, I hate to be the you know bearer of real news, but this that's that's just it. That's well, the way it is. You're just going to blow smoke up their butt. So. Oh, yeah. And, and I could do that. And I could come out with, this is the amazing program. And if you just believe, and if you just work your ass off, and if you just, you have the right mindset, and you follow my direction step by step that you've paid $10,000 for, and you watch my 150 videos, you're going to be a success. Now, that's a scam, man. It's a scam. So, so what do you recommend? So let's say somebody's huh. coming out of COVID. What do you, you, you talked about life coaches, and I love, I'm totally going to remember this. The life coaches are for people who are trust fund babies, right? Or have some kind of income other than life coaching, yeah. Yeah, there's a guy who, there's an article uh, about a guy who his parents had basically paid for him. He hadn't had a job in 10 years, and his parents decided, well, you know, we're not paying for you anymore. We're not, you know, they paid for everything, his house. They gave him an allowance. They gave him an allowance, which was crazy. And they said, no, enough. Get a job. We're, not, we're cutting you off. And he filed a lawsuit in England against his parents. It's in the news today. It's crazy. Um, so obviously not a life coach. But if you were, if you were looking if, for something right now and you said, okay, what's the top, maybe the top couple things or whatever on your list as far as an area that could have a lucrative type of field or business or what you think there's a lot of demand for coming out of COVID, what would you say? Mm. Well, first of all, the guy in England is probably suing his parents based on the principle of promissory estoppel. Okay. So he, maybe he has a case. I don't know. We'll no, if they see. don't have a con if they have a written contract, you're right, for sure. Well, you don't need a written contract. You do. You have to, it has to be considered. Yeah, it has to be a consideration. Yeah, it says a man in England is reportedly suing his parents to get them to pay for his lifestyle. Baez Siddiqui is suing his parents, Rakshanda <laughs> and Javed, in order to get them to fund his living habits. Currently, the 41-year-old Oxford-educated lawyer lives rent-free. That's their problem, is they, they paid for his law school. That's um, their lives, Oxford law school. Yeah, lives rent-free in a $1.2 million London home his parents have. They pay him $475 a week, which is really nothing, no. uh, and foot all the bills. However, they want to turn they want to turn the spigot off, and now Faiz, who is now hasn't had a job since 2011, is suing. He claims, "quote He is entitled to claim maintenance as a quote vulnerable unquote grown up child due to health issues, and that preventing this would be a violation of his human rights." So again, it's not promissory estoppel. He is suing. He has a human rights lawsuit. Right. So that's your life coach. Okay. So. What, what are some areas where you think people could actually do well coming out of COVID? Like, where do you think there's some, there, you know, increased demand? Or... You mean as an, as an entrepreneur or as? Yeah, like if they, if they were starting, if they said, you know what, I'm getting out of the rat race. I'm, um, you know, I want to do my own thing. And then they came across your name. They came across this podcast. They're going to email you. And they said, hey, you know, what are some ideas on you think might, might be some, um, well, you know, some good okay. opportunities post-COVID? I'll know? tell you, I'll tell you what, uh, 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 here's the problem. Everybody that becomes an entre entrepreneur aspires to be Elon Musk, but what they end up being is an Uber driver. Okay. So they've got to be realistic, super realistic and honest about their skill set, not their mindset, but their skill set. Okay. They are not going to be Elon Musk. Okay. Um, they didn't sell uh, uh, PayPal for $100 million, and they didn't start SpaceX, and they didn't start Tesla, and they didn't build a gigafactory giga uh, for batteries, and they didn't, they aren't landing some, building a colony on, the, on Mars. They're not doing any of those things. They're just paying the rent. They're paying the rent. They probably don't even own their own home. They're paying the rent, okay? They're keeping the lights on. So the first and foremost thing they need to do is figure out what it is they can do that has value. 
that people are willing to pay for that doesn't need a billion dollars worth of infrastructure, okay, that they, they can go ahead and, and they can build on that as an entrepreneur. They have to have skills and they have to be able to, 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 to survive without any income for probably a year to two years, okay? And they're gonna lose money after that. And then maybe they'll make money, okay? So it's, it, 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 it's, a, it's, it's extremely challenging, okay? Um, they, have to, they have to listen to every one of our podcasts episodes. <laughs> And they have to get back to us with some good questions. That's the first step, I would say. That's the first step. Okay, good. Um, now let's go ahead and pivot to, we'd met, we tapped out a little bit um, for brick and mortar businesses. So let's say that you had a brick and mortar business, you pared it down, you actually survived. You're not like the restaurants in Old Town that are just shuttered, right? Um, but you actually just, you made it, right? So, and you have somebody that says, hey, I, I need to, you know, I don't know, I've, I've really struggled, I'm, I'm frazzled, I need a fresh outlook on things. So they reach out to you and they say, hey, I have, it could be a pizza joint, it could be a wing place, it could be a paint store, uh, an art gal, like somebody that teaches art classes. We were in one of those this past weekend. Mm. Um, and they said, you know, post-COVID, what would you recommend, Al? And they, they hired you to do some coaching, what would you recommend to them? Well, providing they had the skill set and they were very good at what they did, okay? You're not gonna teach people painting if you can't paint. You're not gonna sell pizzas if you don't know how to make pizzas. You're not gonna be a coach and make any money if you don't know how coaching, okay, et cetera. So providing they have a very good skill set and they have a good mindset, you can have the best skill set, but if you go into it like, oh, I'm a loser, this is working, I don't know how this is going to work, you're not going to take advantage of opportunities, you're not going to create momentum, so you've got to have the skill set and the mindset. Then the third thing you want to focus on, which none of these, most of these people do not want to focus on, including the person that's teaching the art class, making the pizza, delivering the pizza, whatever, marketing marketing, marketing, okay? Because marketing equals sales and sales equals income. Income equals your business continues to grow and you pay the bills and you keep the lights on and you're not living in a van down by the river, okay? So, <laughs> and if you want to know more about marketing and you want to reach out to me, I can help you. Okay, because, but if you qualify to be a client, I don't take on anybody that says, help me. Okay, you have to be qualified. I have to see the potential for helping you. And uh, I've got to see that I, I can help you. Then I will consider you as a client. Okay. The two main areas where I'm helping my clients is being guests on podcasts. Okay because that's going to reach out to a bigger, bigger audience than you're ever going to get handing out flyers in PB, okay? If that would you've got be a Pacific book, Beach here in San Diego. For yeah, time. right, or wherever. Standing on a corner somewhere, handing out flyers, saying I'm a life coach, it isn't going to make it for you. You need to be on podcasts. You need to be recognized as an authority. You need to have a brand. You need to have a specific niche. You can't just say I'm a life coach. I help everybody do anything for any reason at any time. If you pay. So what me. you're saying is you're you're bursting the uh, you're bursting the commonly held rumor that if you hand out business cards on a busy street corner, that's not going to work. Well, it could work. I mean, I don't, I, I was, you know, flyers, you know, I'm not saying don't do it. Okay. I'm just saying that if you really want to reach out to an audience as an authority, as an expert, you need to be held up as an authority and an expert. You need to team up with people who can already reach that audience as opposed to trying to build an email list from zero. Okay. It just it ain't going to work. It's going to be too, it's going to be too difficult. Don't quit your day job. You're not going to be the next Led Zeppelin, okay? Don't quit your day job. No, and I and I think part of it is the people. It's 
you know, I don't think they have a day job if they're going to be entrepreneurs, but I think they do they have, have a day job. Well, Most entrepreneurs think, start out with a day job. True. But I think this past year, it's not a matter of just quitting their day job. I think that would be moronic. Yes. But I think you're looking at people, maybe if they're going into a brick and mortar business, it's like maybe they don't have their day job anymore. <laughs> so now what do they yeah. do? Yeah. And I get what you're saying, though. I understand. Um, yeah. But if you're having an existing, if somebody that has an existing business, you were talking about one, obviously, trying to get your name out there, um, you know, going on podcasts or, you know, other things like that. What other, uh, any other well, recommendations there, you have for them? Well, the two main areas you're going to want to focus on if you're in a service-oriented business, you're going after a niche audience, is being on the right podcast, uh, promoting your book, if you have a book. Uh, obviously taking advantage of every kind of free organic marketing that's available to you, okay, to build momentum, which is your social media and your SEO and your e building your email list and networking and working with and co-venturing with other people where there's a win-win situation, okay? Because it's just, you just do not have enough money for pay per click and native advertising, and you're not going to be you're not going to be advertising during the Super Bowl. You know, you're not going to you're not Procter and Gamble. You know, so you you you're just going to have to be as effective and as efficient and as with the best ROI that you possibly can, and hope you can build momentum for your specific niche audience. Okay, your niche audience has to go deep. OK, if you're a life coach, but you only work with women who are recently divorced, who have kids that have a job in the corporate environment that they're not particularly happy with. And uh, that are reasonably tech savvy, you see, you get what you, you hear, you, you follow what I'm getting at. You have to have a niche that goes deep. You can't just say, well, I work with. You know, I'm a life coach and I work with women who aren't happy. I mean, it's, you're not, so what, right? So what? Are you an authority? Are you an expert? I, do you have a book? Have you been on podcasts? Do you have extensive social media to, to, to connect with? Do you have a following? Do you have a team of people working with you? Do you understand how to use technology? All of these things come into play and they have to be managed properly. How are you managing them on three by five cards? What are you, what are you doing? You know? So for those that are talking, you talk about going deep in a niche. Now, some people here might understand kind of what you're referring to. Give us an example of like the contrast, like a specific contrast between, you know, Hey, I want to do X and then really, really going deep on a niche mm. or a niche. Okay. Okay. Look at the, for example, look at the My Pillow guy. All right. <laughs> I did not a, see that coming. He, he he made a lot of money, but he wasn't My Pillow, My Mattress, uh, My. Uh, he, he wasn't purple. My bedroom. My bedroom. My house. My block. You know, he he just focused on one thing. That he had this pillow, and he just focused on that. But, but even specifically, if you're going to bring him up, it's not even just that he focused on a pillow. He said a pillow that doesn't lose its shape. Right. You could, so it's like, I'm how not many places make a pillow. Are, you can go to Target and buy a pillow. You can go to Walmart and buy a pillow. You can go to uh, the swap meet and buy a pillow. You can go to the I do store not want to buy a pillow from the swap meet. <laughs> yeah, that would be a mistake. <laughs> yeah. I take that back. You do not yeah. want to buy a pillow at the swap meet. Although yeah. I did buy two pillows at the swap meet at one time. They were memory Well, that's how you know. That's how you know. <laughs> I know. Learned. I'm still using them. They were great. You got to be very particular about what you're buying at the swap meet, though. That's another whole show. But anyway, um, my point is, look, if you want to be successful, you have to study success. OK, great, if you great want to, point. If Excellent you want point. to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to study successful entrepreneurs. Now, I don't care what what this guy's my pillow guy's politics are, whether he wrote, you know, just 
produced a movie that explains how all the how the entire election was a sham and all. I don't care. Okay, if this guy made that much money selling a pillow, okay, through infomercials, that then he was successful doing that. Fine, you know. But you can't be successful doing everything for everybody all the time. It just doesn't work. You have to really focus. All right. So uh, sometimes that means studying the people that have been successful doing what it is that you want to do. You can't go wrong with that. Okay. So is there anybody on that note? Is there anybody that you looked into um, that you studied? that kind of gave you a window and kind of to see what you wanted to do or how you wanted to approach things. Mm. That's like, I'll question. tell you while you're thinking about it, like for me, there were two that really, you know, kind of jumped into it. One was Elon Musk, um, just understanding his background. And the big thing that I learned from him is that, you know, this guy was, was studying rocket fuel as a kid. He was making, like he said, you can't buy rocket fuel in South Africa. You had to make your own. <laughs> And so mm -hmm. he studied chemistry to figure out how to make the best rocket fuel. Mm -hmm. And from the very beginning, he had a whole thing of like he wanted he wanted to wean the world off of fossil fuels, among a couple other goals. But and it, you know, so the idea of him making Teslas and hey, I'll make this really cool electric car. He didn't wake up one day and did that. He's been mm -hmm. thinking about doing this since he was a kid. So I mm -hmm. think having mm -hmm. a passion um, and, and increasing your skill set, like you had mentioned that before. Um, and developing your skill set, developing your skill set, going to school, studying finance, studying, um, you know, aerodynamics, chemistry, all these things enabled him to get to a point where he's at right now, um, obviously is a big thing. But the one that I always look at, especially when it comes to business, is, is um, I was going to say Tim Cook. No, uh, Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs, you know, he went through some very ups and downs. Uh, you know, he had successes, failures, but he was not afraid to look himself in the eye and identify what were the weaknesses he had. You mean being an asshole? Well, but he, yeah, kind of, sort of, but yeah, he was, but he understood like he was not good with people at Apple. He was a great, you know, designer. He was a visionary, but he sucked with people. And when he left, he got driven out of Apple. He didn't leave Apple. When he got driven out of Apple, he went to Atari and then he went to Next and then he went to Pixar. And he spent a lot of time working on his management and leadership skills. And he blended in with his Buddhism and all that stuff. But um, it was one of these things where he came back and he just, he, he identified his weaknesses. He worked on them. He didn't abandon. He knew what his strengths were. He had a vision of what he wanted the world to be. I mean, that guided all of his products. And at the same time, he wasn't afraid he wasn't looking to take his cues from other people. So when he went to Apple the second time, he get he you know kind of gathered all the project managers together and basically said, "Hey, what are what are you guys working on?" And realized he said he he shut down every project product except one. And he said that the next big thing isn't here. So he just said, "We're not wasting our money. We're going to keep our powder dry." And we're going to wait for what is the next big thing. And that's when he ran into Sean Parker with Napster. And he realized there's no sexy way to play music. And that's when he launched the iPod. And it completely changed Apple from being a company that was that Pepsi guy was putting out the Newton, which was terrible. Mm. Um, and then he went to the iMac, which was the only project that he kept. And it was, the, I forget the guy who was the designer on that. Um, he was wise enough to see that this guy was worth his weight in gold canceled all the other products, but he was still known as the bubbly, neon bubbly computer guy, right? Um, but then the iPod changed everything. And so for me, it's like you look at him and you identify that like, you're going to stick to your guns, you're going to stick to your believe in, you're not afraid to make, you know, make decisions based on that, regardless of how unpopular or popular they are. Um, you know what you're really good at, you keep focusing on that. But if there's an area that's, that's kind of pulling you underwater, then, you know, you need to take time and, and be humble enough to identify that, address that and work on that. And then, you know, learn from your mistakes. So yeah. um, I, I think those two are the ones that I look at whenever I make, you know, if I'm trying to figure out what to do or what direction to go into, I, I a lot of times I ask myself, like, what would Elon or, or, or Steve Jobs do? 
Um, and then sometimes I say, what would Tim Cook do? And I do the opposite. Um, so, so, but, but that's kind of, kind of where I come from. So for you, like, do you have anything on that? Well, that first of out? all, yeah. First of all, insiders who were alive at the time that Apple made that transition know that Apple would not be in business today if Bill Gates hadn't loaned them $800 million. Okay. People don't ever talk about that. Um, and by loan, I mean gave it to them. Okay. So um, it's easy to look back at with 2020 hindsight and say, you know, he was a visionary, he was this, he was that. But if anything had gone two degrees different in a different direction, be people would say, Apple, who? You mean the, the Beatles record company? What are you talking about? Oh, you mean that company that went out of business 20 years ago? Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, well, right nice. now, Apple Apple is very profitable right now because they have a loyal base of users who won't use anything else. And so they're willing to pay $800 to $1,000 for a phone, iPhone, that costs Apple $12.50 to make. Okay? So there you go. I mean, obviously, they're going to be profitable. But many companies they could apple could still go into the toilet you know they could go the way of of many companies um i have like i said last time on our podcast i have a phone right here that i paid 21 dollars and 50 cents for it does everything i need runs all the apps runs perfect perfect voice perfect text does everything okay um so why would i pay 850 dollars for an iphone I'm not their customer, but somebody is their customer, obviously, because they're making great money and their stock's doing well. Um, my story is a little bit different, okay? I became an entrepreneur, entrepreneur because I literally could not stand working for a corporation, big corporation, which I had worked for some big corporations, and I got screwed by one big corporation, um, literally uh, out of a year and a half worth of 12 hour days um, because my boss realized that um, the product that I was in charge of was going to overtake the product that he was in charge of on a mainframe and I, mine was on a PC and so he found a reason to let me go after a year and a half and I swore on a stack of Bibles that I would never work for a big corporation again. And I spent 25 years in IT and basically uh, had invested also in real estate and had my own company and basically retired from my company and did a lot of other interesting things in life. And now I'm doing what I'm doing because I enjoy it. If I literally had no client for the next year, I could still live and survive and do quite well. So I'm not your typical entrepreneur that had a job for six months or a year or spent 10 years as a high-end waiter in a hottie toddy restaurant and now all the restaurants are closed and they're looking to transition to become an entrepreneur because they invented some thingamajig i mean come on man you know so my situation is a little different than most people and i'm a lot older than you are believe it or not so i'm at a point in my life where I don't want, I, I, I like to sleep at night. I haven't invested in the stock market. I've sold my real estate um, and I help my clients and I'm, I'm very particular about the clients I do take on. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite comfortable as long as I have my health. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in good, good shape. But then again, I'm not married and I'm not putting three kids through college. So <laughs> that's right. You know, yeah. it's funny, I was on that note, you know, this is a little bit analogous to what we're talking about. So we had this conversation um, a couple of weeks ago um, about my wife's best friend's kid, 16 years old, and we were talking about college. And I'm just a firm believer that it, like, if I had somebody, if I had a kid in college and she has a 14 year old, um, yeah, the major you choose and the school you go to are going to have a lot to say with how much if any, we contribute to it. Like if you go in and oh, say, yeah. I'm going to be a, if I'm going to be a history, you know, that was my dad's major back in the day. If I'm going to be a history major, okay, you get zero dollars. Yeah. You're definitely moving out upon graduation for sure. hundred yeah. percent. No, nobody's, I don't think anybody 
in the history of, of, of college has ever been criticized for getting a computer science degree at Stanford. Okay. Right. Or am I, you know, MIT is not a bad place. If you're on the oh. wait list at Stanford, MIT <laughs> is a nice fallback school. <laughs> And if you but can get into, if you're going to get a history degree, you should get a history degree at Harvard. Okay, that's true. Although I will say this, like MIT. Conan if, we're, if we're going to have a detraction, is that, is that he went to Harvard with a history degree? Well, it's nice to be a stand-up comedian too. So I guess well, yeah, he was a writer on SNL. That's where he really right. got. It. Yeah. So I guess if we're going to if we're going to bag on MIT, it's like, well, I did see Goodwill Hunting. And when the janitor is better at math than the students are, probably not a good school, right? Is that, is that the logic we want to have? I don't. Well, you know, how many genius janitors are there out there, you know? I mean, but it's like, if you're sitting here, you're paying what? Probably 60 grand. Well, it's 99. So let's say it was, yeah, about 60 grand still to go to MIT. And then you find out from your professor that the janitor, the overnight janitor is solving things that you can't solve maybe you ought to go and pick another major. Yeah, well, not everybody can be Alan Turing, you know? I mean, some people are just born with a gift, okay? But- That's true. Yeah. So, and you know what he calls is, well, I'm, it's a bad joke. I'm not even gonna give it a- Don't, don't go there. We're almost it up. A, it's been almost two hours. We're gonna yeah. need to wrap up here. Well, we have our edit button too, so it won't be quite yeah, two yeah. hours though. You have- For those who are listening, button. we have our raw video and we have our edited video. <laughs> um, all right. So with that being said, with that being said, one last group we want to hit on and then we'll wrap up the day. So let's say we, we're going to specifically talk about people and we're going to get into more of the weeds a little bit here. So you have somebody that either maybe lost their job or cut their hours, or whatever. They've been dramatically impacted by COVID one way or another. Maybe they're one of the people that's 11 months back on their rent. Mm. They're praying to God that that eviction moratorium on federally backed mortgages doesn't go away, right? I mean, they are just stiffing the bank, stiffing their landlord, uh, credit card bills are through the roof. And they say to them, oh, forget about credit card bills, because I don't want to taint your answer. But let's say they're saying, okay, enough of this. I I've been through enough of these ups and downs. I, I just, I can't go back and trust that I'll be okay if I just pretend like you know, I'll get a new job when this ends and things will go back to normal and this will be a blip in the year. This year will be a blip in history and it never happened, quote unquote, right? I want to start my own thing. What are the first one or two things that you, like actual tactile things that you would have them do? Um, obviously coming up with an idea for sure, like what they want to do, but what are, one, what are, what are some of the first things that you would recommend um, them do before they invest any money in the business? Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, do something that you know really well, that you enjoy doing, and that you don't have to go up a huge learning curve, okay? So kind of narrow down that. Find a niche that you can serve that isn't overly swamped with competitors that have been in business for 10 years you know they'll they find some, find a niche where you where you can shine okay set up your business so that you're not trading your time for money okay i don't care how you do it and you might need to look to some experts to help you but don't trade one hour of your time for $10, $50, or $100, or $1,000, because you only have so much time. Find a way to sell a package of something, okay? It's just like, find something that has a trend, upward trend curve, okay? Don't get into the buggy whip manufacturing business, all right? Find something with an upward trend. Find something that you can leverage technology, okay? Find something that looks like it's going to, the demand is going to continue, but the competition isn't going to continue as fast, okay? Um, model your business after something you've had experience in where you could, you, you know people and you've worked with people who have been successful doing that, 
okay? Find a business where you can leverage yourself, leverage the work. In other words, if you want to be a janitor and make minimum wage, okay, but wouldn't you be better off as somebody who has a business that employs 20 janitors? You see how you're leveraging that? Then your main job is to go to uh, uh, business parks and say, hey, look, we'll undercut the competition for 20 bucks and we'll clean 20% better. And you get that contract and you put those people to work. So always be focusing on marketing, always be leveraging technology, always be leveraging your resources, Make sure you have resources in place that you can go for a period of time and not worry about keeping the lights on. Because what you don't want to do is get to the point where your business is on the verge of being successful, but you have to close down because you don't want to live in a van by the river, you know? Or even if you live in a van by the river, make sure you have one kick ass website. You, you follow what I'm saying? So there's so many factors involved here. But you got to stick with the fundamentals. Focus on marketing, focus on management. Let other people pay other people minimum wage to do the job that you're making five times the return on their time. You see, that's how you make money as an entrepreneur. And that's how you get a business going. And that's hopefully how you become successful. It's got to be sustainable. It's got to be scalable. And at some point anyway, it's got to be profitable. And you've got to be able to scale. If you cannot scale, you may as well go to work for somebody else. There's less headaches, there's guaranteed paycheck, and you get benefits, okay? And don't become an entrepreneur because you want to change the world or you have a vision for, you know, saving the world or whatever. No. Become an entrepreneur because you have something valuable to offer, okay? You can make a difference, yeah, okay. But also you're gonna make money. You're gonna make money. That's what you wanna be in business for, is to make money, okay? So that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add on that. I'll say number one, I think you're piggybacking off a little bit what you said. Uh, you wanna find that area of high demand um, with what I call a tight niche, meaning if you go into a place, if you say, hey, I wanna go and do this, good news, no one else is doing it. I don't have any competitors. You have to say to yourself, well, the world's not full of dumb people. If you're, if nobody's doing what you're doing at all, then you, and it's not to say that it can't work, but you have to ask why is nobody doing it? Right. I mean, there's 6 billion people on the planet. Why are none of them doing it? Um, so you want to go into a field you know, if there's nobody, if there, it's a field where nobody's doing it, like buggy whips, right? I'm going to go make buggy whips, like big Mac Johnson over there. Then, you know, all right, well, how much demand is there for a buggy whip? You don't want to do that. But it's like, what's an area of demand that people might need it? So let's, I'm just going to make something up, something I would never want to do. But let's say you said, I'm going to open a pest, you know, pest control business. Okay, people need that because there's pests, right? Here in California, there's a lot of termites. Um, but you want to have a tight termites, God knows Yeah, what exactly. But you want to have a tight niche. So you're not going to go, okay, I'm going to open up a termite company. Well, it's like you're going to have to compete with some really big names with big budgets and big brand, well defined brands. But it's like, what's your niche? Okay, well, I only work on ranch level houses, or I only work on, uh, go back to your trailer park. I only work on trailer parks or whatever it is. You know, one of my friends, he's a certified financial planner and he and I were texting last night. Um, ironically, I had no idea I was going to bring him up today. And he, but he only works with dentists. Mm. So like if you, if I said, Hey, Trevin, you know, would you manage my money? He's like, you're not a dentist. No, that's not who I work with. So when he goes and introduces himself and he says, I'm a certified financial planner, uh, that I only work with dentists. If you know, if a dentist goes, really? I, there's that that exists, and all of a sudden there's a massive curiosity. Plus, he knows everything that goes into their business as far as you know, capital expenditures and insurance and absolutely all different things. So yes. it, it so and ironically, he's never been a dentist, so I don't know how he got into that field. But um, <laughs> it's an example of one that I love using as far as a very tight niche. So. 
if I said, if you said, hey, I want to be, you know, let's say you said, okay, I want to work with people that, that want to be life coaches, homeless, um, then <laughs> it's like, okay, well, what's your niche? Maybe you only want to work with women coming out of college, right? Right. Maybe you want to work with um, people like women who their kid just graduated from high school and they want to do something, but a very right. specific niche. Yes. You know that really well. Yes. Um, and really, in the end, you want to ask yourself, can I do what other people are doing? But to quote the old BASF tagline, can I do it better than they're doing? Not for everybody. No. But for a certain set of people. Mm -hmm. So in baseball, for example, there's this whole niche for people who want to be a pitcher in the major leagues. And let's say if you're going to be in the major leagues, you're going to have to throw minimum 90, but probably 95 miles an hour. Right. Mm -hmm. But let's say you're only throwing 83, right? You're not mm. going to, you're not going to get a sniff. Well, there's these academies and there's like professional, like there's a guy that just signed with the Dodgers for some God forsaken amount of money. Um, and he went to one of these they are called velocity academies. And all they do is they get your velocity up. So we'll take mm -hmm. you from 80 to 90 or 83 to 95. Mm-hmm. And it's like, if that's all they do, they don't teach pitching mechanics. They don't, or like, they don't teach how to throw a curveball. They don't teach anything else. They just get your velocity up. Mm -hmm. Nobody's doing that. There's a lot of pitching coaches up there. There's a lot of baseball coaches up there, but there's only a couple that do this particular thing. Um, and they do it really well. So you're adding mm -hmm. value on that. But you want to do something that other people do, but do it as a better deal or in a better way than anybody else can do it. And if you're a brick and mortar business, you don't have to do it better than everybody else does it in your city. You just have to do it better than everybody does in your neighborhood. So start small. Um, one thing you had mentioned, and I actually added this in, I wasn't planning on putting this in here, is you know, you talked about like you don't want to be working a million hours a week. So when you're working a business, you wanna almost you want to treat your business as if it were a job and ask yourself at the end of a given month or a week, what would your hourly wage be? So if you make $5,000 in a month or $4,000 in a month, how many hours did it take to get there? Were you working 80 hours a week? And then the guy who's working 30 hours a week is making you know, more than twice what you're making per hour. So you want to ask yourself, is the juice worth the squeeze for what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Because if it's not, you're going to burn out. Um, exactly. another, on top of that, and this is something one of, you had mentioned this a little bit, but one of my old uh, marketing mentors uh, mentioned this. He says you want to, you want to, you're going to get paid based on your skill set. If you don't have much of a skill set, you're not going to open up a business and make tons of money. You have to be able to do something better. I have a, this British guy that I met, and he literally bought these companies. He bought this company that does grease trapping. And if you met this guy, you'd say there's no way in the world this guy knows anything about grease trapping at all. It's a, it's a British, a small, a very small not frail, but very thin looking British guy named Simon Hewitt. And there's a lot of Simon Hewitt, so I'm not even diming the guy out. But the most British name ever, Simon Hewitt. Um, and he just, I asked him, how'd you get into it? He goes, I just realized these people, I could make more money doing what they're doing already. And I'll just make a couple tweaks and I'll make a lot more money than they were making. So having a, but having a particular skill set, if you're really good at marketing, you're going to make more money than anybody else. If you're really good at aerospace design, you're going to you're going to make a lot of money. So having a skill set. If you want to be, you know, it's the same reason why if somebody wants to go and become a nurse, they go to nursing school. They have to develop their skill set to be able to do that. You just don't say, I want to be a nurse. Well, if you go to nursing school, not really. But I've watched a lot of nurses. You know, I've it's changed a like, few bedpans. Yeah, it's like Pete Buttigieg. You know, what do you know about? You know, what qualifies you to be commerce secretary or a transportation secretary? Well, I was like trains as a kid. No, 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 that's not going to end well. <laughs> you know? Um, so anyway, that's one of them. And then the last one, and I think this is a really big one, and you alluded this a little, you didn't hit it dead on the money, but you hit it kind of tangently on a couple points, is you want to look at what you have a passion for. Like when things are tough, and it's tiring, and you're not having a lot of success, and you're getting worn down, and you're working long days early on, and you're not having the results, and doubt creeps in, and frustration creeps in, and you get people that say, oh, I don't know if this is going to work for you, buddy. Do you have a passion that like 
you're just going to, you, you, it's not that it's a job. You just want to do it. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what I learned from Elon Musk is like, none of this is a job for him. It's all passion. They're all hot. Like it's not even hobbies, but they're all just passion plays for him. Mm-hmm. And so like, what's one thing. And I, you know, this is kind of what I thought when I was opening the business, I would ask myself, even before I came up with the idea, I'm like, what do I know a lot about that I could literally just talk for hours on hours and hours upon it and not get bored with? Mm. And that was my initial field that I worked with. And from there, I kind of tried to narrow it down. But if I don't know anything about a particular area and I'm not very skilled and I'm not very knowledgeable, it's not probably going to work. And if I'm not passionate about it, it's probably not going to work because I'm the person that has to do all the, the grunt work. Mm-hmm. I have to make all the decisions. I have to spend my time. I'm the one putting all the sweat equity in. So it's like, what's your passion? You know, my wife, I, I, I still think down the line that she's going to have an art studio. It's something she loves doing, right? Mm-hmm. She's great at it. She doesn't believe in herself enough as, as well as she should. Um, but when she, when she retires from being a teacher, like she could totally, she's, she's good enough that if she went down to an art fair, she could have a booth and sell a ridiculous amount of stuff. She has this one niche. It's crazy. She'll take a deck of playing cards and she cuts them up into pieces and she makes like literally portraits and landscapes just mm. using playing card pieces. Like a mosaic. It's a, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a mosaic. And it's <laughs> it's the most amazing thing. I want to see if she has any up here. But she has it's one of the most amazing things that I've ever seen. And the first time I saw it, I'm like, that's nuts. Nobody does that. It's mm-hmm. such a cool niche. And I guarantee you, if somebody buys one of your pieces, they're going to want them all. Mm. Right? So, but it's a passion of hers. It's a talent of hers. Um, you know, it's just one of those things that she just has to pull the trigger when the time comes. I mean, probably when she retires from school. But mm-hmm. those are the four things that I looked at. Is like, you want to find something that people are doing, but really make, do it better in a particular area. Tighten your niche niche or whatever is that, that anybody else can do get it is so down to a niche that you can't even get any further so it could be um you know women that just graduated college with you know and can't haven't got a job in three months mm. right struggle to get a job could be well anything. they have to be able to afford your services also no but understood 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 yeah. it could be whatever it is right yeah um it could be trust fund babies like, those are great. Why not trust fund babies, right? Um, they'll pay the money. Um, secondly, you want to consider your hourly wage and what it would be based on what you're working. Is the juice worth the squeeze? What's your skill set? What can you contribute to the world that adds value? Because you're going to get paid in accordance with that value. That's what capitalism is. And then lastly, what's your passion? Like, you know, is this something you have a passion for? You know, could you talk for six, seven hours on it? You look at these people that are the most successful podcasters. Joe Rogan will drop three to four hours with certain guests. He doesn't even notice it. Doesn't, I don't even know if he takes a pee break, right? But it's like, this is what he loves doing. And it's why he's successful, right? If he wasn't, if he just was here, oh, great, I have to do uh, two more episodes today. I don't feel like doing this. He wouldn't be as good as he is, you know? So those are my thoughts on it. Um, for those of you guys that are that are looking to go into post-COVID, just understand if you have any doubts, any insecurities, you don't know what you're doing or where to go, just understand none of us have been through this before. There was a lady that just died. Either she just died or she just turned like 118 or something. But she was like four years old when the, her family went through the Spanish flu. And she even said she didn't even know. And so it's like, we're all going through this together the first time. So if you're trying, if you're at a point where you either have an existing online business or a virtual business, you have an existing brick and mortar business, or you're looking to start a business now, um, just understand there's a lot of work to be done. Not necessarily grunt work, but there's a lot of thought that needs to go into what you're doing. So understand that we're all in the same boat together, but those are the points that Al shared and the points that I shared, I think are very valuable in that regard. Now, if that being said, if you have any specific questions that you want us to answer, um, our information, if you want to contact Al or you want to contact me, our contact information is in the show notes. So make sure you click on that and uh, we'll be happy to get back in touch with you. If you have any ideas for shows that you would want to see, um, we're always interested in that as well. 
Um, and I guess before we head off, any last bit of wisdom before we sign off today, Al? Mm. Well, you know, we've been talking for over two hours, and I think it only goes to prove that we enjoy what we do. So, uh, yeah, if you want to be an entrepreneur, it isn't just about money. It's about putting in the time, the effort, the diligence, the research. And if you're not enjoying what you do, don't do it. Life's too short. That's the last thing I want to say. Yeah, and I'll echo that as we head out. Uh, if you're doing this for money, you're going to fail. It's, mm. it's, it, entrepreneurship is so up and down. You, it's, you, you can't do it for money. You have to do it because you love it. Right. You know, if you were a trust fund baby, you hit the lottery, you hit, you had, I forget what the investment you talked about earlier was, and you're all of a sudden this millionaire when you're retiring. The question is, would you start your business if you were financially set for life? And if the answer is no, don't do it. Simple as that. There's no other questions right. to ask, right? Right. Um, but if you were, if you're going to do it anyway, you know, money, money aside, um, I think you've passed the first gate in questioning whether you want to do it or not. So. Uh, great show today, Al. I really appreciate it. Um, sure. We will see you guys next week. With that being said, my name is Matt. And I am Al. And we will see you later. Adios, muchachos. Arrivederci. <laughs>